Hey, what's up everybody? This is Pastor Richie Halverson. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about overcoming obstacles and objections to baptism. I've entitled this short presentation, Am I a Stepping Stone or a Stumbling Block? So as you read the book of Acts, you quickly pick up on a pattern and that is when Christ is lifted up, people start showing up and the baptistry starts filling up. I mean, every chapter there are baptisms. Acts 2.41, 3,000. Acts 4.4, 5,000. Acts 2.47 says, each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. But friends, if we're honest, if, we, if it was up to some of the people that we pastor, if it was up to some of our colleagues, if it was up to the long process and procedure we put some people through for baptism. Pentecost never would have happened because how in the world can God add to the church daily if everybody who wants to be baptized has to go through a three-month intensive Bible study, recite all 28 fundamental beliefs, and have all their issues worked out? Tell me, where in the Bible does it say that we have to know everything before being baptized? Where in the Bible does it say we can't be struggling before we're baptized? You know, you won't baptize someone who's still struggling with smoking, but you don't hesitate to baptize that person who's still hating. For some people, friends, it's never enough. They would have had a problem with John the Baptist when he baptized Jesus. They would have told him that he baptized him too soon. You know, I've heard people suggest the reason the apostles could baptize people quicker was that there were not as many false teachings, that people knew their Bible better, um, and what was the other? Oh, that the Holy Spirit gave them a crash course in good theology. Friends, that's not in the Bible. In Acts 10, 47 through 48, we have the infamous conversion of Cornelius, the Gentile, who was not raised going to church, who probably did not know his Bible as well as his Jew Jewish counterparts, but he was faithful with what little he knew, and the Holy Spirit was moving in his life, and so Peter boldly proclaims, who can object to their being baptized? That word object is this Greek word that means to hinder or to stop someone from doing something they should do. We see it again in Acts 8, 36 and 38. As they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And notice Philip doesn't say, I do. You know, let me put you through the test. Let me clear and approve you. Friends, Luke 17, once Jesus says to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him or her through who? Through him from whom they come. And that's why Peter in Acts 11 says, who am I to stand in God's way? I don't know about you, but I want to be a stepping stone, not a stumbling block. 1 Peter 2.5, it says that we are to be living stones, stepping stones that God is using to build up his spiritual temple. Man, I want to be a part of the solution, not the problem. Lord, help me get out of the way and help clear the way so someone can step in the water with you today. You see, too often we forget whose decision baptism is. It's not your decision. It's not the elder's decision. It's not the parent's decision. It's not that dear saint who thinks every decision is their decision's decision. Okay? Uh, you know, it's, it's the individual's decision. I don't ask the board permission. I inform them so they can join the celebration. You see, this is why I believe in the book of Acts. Whenever someone makes a decision for baptism, it's followed by a particular word, command. They commanded the chariot to pull over. He commanded them to be baptized. Man, when someone made a decision for baptism, they took it seriously. They didn't discuss it. They didn't form a committee on it. They facilitated it. And this is why I don't like the saying that we use sometimes as pastors, and I'm guilty of it myself, where we say, you know, I cleared them for baptism. Look, did Philip clear the Ethiopian? Did Paul clear the Philippian jailer? We don't clear anyone for baptism. The Holy Spirit clear, clears them, cleans them, cleanses them, transforms them. Our job is just to love them as we continue growing in Christ with them. We're not called to be the inspector, the quality control, controller, the contemplator, the debater. We're called to be the Holy Spirit facilitator. It is sad, but sometimes the greatest objections and obstacles come closest from home. Sometimes our friends and family, those who should be the greatest encouragement can sometimes be the greatest detriment. 
And that's why when I do visitation or when I meet with someone to affirm their decision for baptism, man, I want to meet with that person uh, individually and personally without the family and friends that come with them that could influence their decision. See, too often we look Uh, to or or we let someone else make our decision for us. You know, there was this old saying and uh, evangelists would say, pushing for a decision and being born into a family of evangelists. I grew up hearing that phrase. So I was talking to a group of pastors once and I used that phrase to which one pastor says, you know what, I don't like that saying, pushing for a decision. I thought about what he said for a second and I looked at him and I said, look, I can guarantee you the devil's pushing them towards hell. What's wrong if I give them a nice little gentle push towards heaven? No, we don't want to be pushy, but we do want to be conduits through which the Holy Spirit pulls people into his purpose. Man, in Acts 16, Lydia uh, is baptized, and in verse 14, it says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what Paul said. Now, it wasn't Paul's words that influenced Lydia's decision. It wasn't Paul who pushed Lydia into her decision. It was the Holy Spirit moving through Paul's words that pushed Lydia to make her decision. Acts, uh, John 6, 44, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. See, every single desire to go to God comes from God. One thing we know for sure, the devil is not encouraging anyone to be baptized. Come on now. I want to be a stepping stone, not a stumbling block. What about you? I'll never forget growing up as a young kid and watching my dad do evangelism, whether it was preaching a sermon or in personal invitation or visitation. I would watch as he would zone in and focus on the individual He would sit there in an attentive and open posture because, you see, body language can be a barrier. He always would move his chair closer to the individual while respecting their personal space. He would remove the distance and the obstacles coming between him and the individual. He would never argue or debate with the person. The moment the person made their decision, made up their mind, he would respect that decision even if he did not agree with that decision. And he remained positive. You see, I learned from my dad that overcoming objections to baptism is more about asking the right questions than it is about having the right answers. Do you see the importance of surrendering your life to God? Do you believe God loves you and wants what's best for you? Do you believe uh, that the seventh day is the Sabbath? Do you believe that your body is a temple of uh, of the Holy Spirit? Always frame your appeals with questions that require an answer. It's hard for people to make commitment. One of the growing objections I hear from people for baptism is that they'll say, well, if I'm baptized, why do I have to become a part of the church? And I don't want to get into the theology about that, but but bottom line, people need community. And we can't do this alone. And in the Bible, when people were baptized, they were immediately brought into the body of Christ, warts and all. And that was not only good for the new believer, but the old timer. So when someone comes to me and they say, you know what, I've made a decision for be baptized, but why do I have to join your church? I'll flip it on them. I'll play a Uno reverse card. I'll answer their question with the question. When they say, why do I have to join the church? I'll ask them, why not join the church? I remind them we need each other, that I'm going to be their pastor, that I'm going to be there to coach them and cheer them on and support them. I'm going to be there to encourage what they do. Friends, always frame things in the most positive way positive. Use the most inclusive language you can. Be cognizant of people's context. Know people's hopes, dreams, and fears. For every problem, you've got to bring a solution. When it comes to overcoming obstacles, we need to not only know what to say and when to say it, we need to know what not to say and when to shut up. I've seen pastors talk people out of decisions for baptism because they couldn't stop talking. The moment someone makes a decision, we need to set a date for that baptism. And I'm not talking months. I'm talking a week, two weeks max. Sure, they may need to study a little bit more between now and then. But remember, baptism is only the beginning. Friends, never forget the power of baptism of the Holy Spirit didn't happen until after the baptism of water in Jesus' name. 
And that's where the power comes from, from the Holy Spirit. You see, the gospel is not get ready and then come to Jesus. It's come to Jesus right now, just as you are, and he's going to get you ready. The first three steps of the 12 steps are often summarized like this. I can't, step one. He can, step two. I think I'll let him, step three. That's the essence of baptism. I can't quit. I can't stop. I can't change. I can't do this. But hallelujah, I know a God who can. I empathize with the individual. I share my journey with the individual. I feel what you're feeling. I've struggled with the same thing. But let me tell you what God did in my life. We don't need to be perfect to be baptized because Jesus was perfect. In fact, when you're baptized, you're baptized into his perfection. Keep close to Jesus. You're going to continue growing in him. Keep your eyes on him. And when you slip or trip, let him pick you back up. Don't you dare give up five minutes before the miracle. Because Paul says in Philippians 1.6, that there has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you is going to keep at it until he brings it to a flourishing finish on the very day Jesus Christ appears. You are works in progress. Your sin has nothing on your Savior. Your worst dysfunction won't keep you from, from um, your destiny if you surrender your life to God. One drop of Jesus' blood has more power in transforming grace than every sin ever committed in the universe. Man, we have a good shepherd. And no matter how far, you don't have to worry. You just call on his name and he's there in a hurry. You don't have to worry. Because I've discovered in my own life that there ain't no mountain high enough and there's, there ain't no valley low enough and there ain't no river wide enough that's going to keep your God from getting to you. Lord, I want you to make me a stepping stone, not, not a stumbling block. Make me a safe place for your precious children to find grace. May I be a firm footing, not only into the baptistry, but throughout the rest of their life. May God bless you and keep you.